and to take this time out of our busy weeks as we head towards now the end of our term. I pray, Lord, that you would be with each one of our students, each one of our faculty members, each one of our various directors and staff members in all the various functions and tasks that they perform. And we know, Lord, that all of this work that we do, even though it may vary and the various tasks and responsibilities we have are different, that we are gathered together here at McMaster Divinity College to serve you and to serve uh, your church. And we pray that the work that we do would be pleasing to you. We pray now, Lord, that as we take this time out of our week, that you would reward that time by moving closer to us and that we would respond to you, whether it's through songs or through the words that we hear and say. Pray, Lord, that uh, you would be pleased as we worship you and that we would then hear from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to begin by singing one hymn together, and um, the theme for our day today comes from Psalm 29, themes of praising God as creator, focusing on his majesty, and then also the result of peace that we find in him. And these are uh, corresponding to uh, Dr. Hilber's um, themes for today, and so we thank him for that. So let's stand and sing um, All Creatures of Our God and King. Okay, I'm back already, probably missed me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, introduce to you, the person I'm gonna introduce here in just a minute. It came across, it came about in a kind of an unusual way. Wendy and I went out to dinner uh, with a couple of surgeons. Now, I have to warn you, if you ever get an invitation like that, things get a little dicey when they start bringing out their phones with pictures of their latest surgery right over dinner. Uh, but we had a great time anyway, but we had this opportunity to meet and be with actually our good friend Stuart Archibald, and you've heard him before here uh, in chapel, but also a new friend to us. And this is uh, Dr. Stephen Foster. And he's a graduate of the McMaster University Medical School, did his residency in Toronto, and has spent nearly 50 years as a surgeon in Angola. 
and has done some incredible things there. And we thought it would be a great opportunity uh, to invite Stephen to say a few words and to tell a little bit about uh, the missionary work that he does there in Angola as a surgeon. So Stephen, welcome. Look forward to hearing a few things from you. Thank you. Well, it's always a privilege to come back to Mac and realize, my goodness, the campus has changed. And I didn't recognize where to get in the door here this, both this morning and early this afternoon. Um, the campus has changed, is changing, and I'm sure just to learn a little bit from Dr. Stan about what God's doing here at the seminary too. What an answer to long prayer. No, to try to help you understand in a five minute thumb sketch, uh, as a boy, I found out I was a missionary's kid and my grandparents were missionaries. My grandparents moved to Zambia, which was then Northern Rhodesia, 106 years ago. My father was born in Zambia. I went there when I was eight months old, and so my boyhood mem memories are African bush, going to boarding school, learning to play rugby. And I really appreciate the World Cup as the semifinals, South Africa, the box, beat the Brits. No. Still got to beat the New Zealanders, and that's going to be a, a tall order this Sunday. But in that sense, coming to Canada in 65 and going to University of Toronto and discovering that of all places, a divinity college was opening a medical school. My father just about fell out the window when I called him saying, I wasn't going to the University of Toronto. I was going to come to McMaster in 69. And in 71, John Evans heard about me as the dean and heard I was trying to do one of these international electives trying to answer the question, what does my dad do as a physician in the bush? What does that look like? And I spent three months in 71 in the summer, and the first patient had been mauled by a lioness. Got to hunt the lion, discovered the lion was much smarter than I was. And um, but I came away feeling I really got to learn surgery if I'm going to make a contribution as a generalist in the middle of nowhere. And in 73, my wife and I went on a honeymoon. Stuart stood as my best man. And um, we were interns together at the Toronto General. Went on to do general surgery in Toronto. And in 75, we're praying a very simple prayer. Dad, Lord, Dad has been in Angola for five years now. Changed from Northern Rhodesia to now Angola. Started looking and understanding a little bit about Angola but didn't understand what 480 years of colonialism had done to the mindset of Angolans. And what had happened and has happened, as you look at your historical records, Angola contributed a third of the world's slaves to the New World. One simple place where 50 plus language groups, a, province, a country the size of the province of Ontario, Today, plus or minus 37 million, heading towards 50 million, because we're having birth rates in Angola are the fastest in the world. One third of Angolan children don't get past age five. So you ask, why did COVID do such a poor job at killing Africans? All the, they got all, all the under, underpowered people whose immune systems weren't doing a thing. They died before they got to age five. So your survivors are tough people and COVID didn't get much traction amongst us. But in 75, I found myself praying, Lord, send somebody to replace my dad. And I knew it couldn't be me because I didn't speak Portuguese with a grade six certificate. I didn't have a tropical medicine certificate and all those things you were required if you're gonna get the Portuguese to give you a visa. My dad went to the governor general and he waived all the rules and the only person left to say no was the Dean of Postgraduate Education in Toronto. And when I explained my plan, he leaned across his desk, took my hand, said, young man, this is the best idea of any guy's been in here in a long time talking about when do you need to leave? Those six months in Angola from July the 1st to the early December changed my trajectory to think that men and women I met were willing to pray that I would come back and serve in Angola. 
And so two years later in 78, when I'd finished my exams and all that kind of stuff, I had two children, Peggy had our first two daughters who had been born. We found ourselves saying, Lord, what's left? The guerrilla war had panned into a war between three different parties. All of a sudden, Angola had been torn apart. All the mission hospital structures from the 1880s through 1970s had been destroyed, with the exception of one mission hospital. I became the surgeon for one million people, plus or minus. You discover that your nurses can do a lot. All my amputations were done by my nursing staff. All my open and closed laparotomies were done by my nursing staff. All my cesarean sections are still done by my nursing staff to this day. So if you want a cesarean in Angola, you can get it cheap and you can get it real quick. 20 minutes in and you're on your way home. <laughs> and you get it done under local so that you can listen to the baby. And once we clamp the cord, we give you some ketamine. Yeah, we won't get too graphic. But um, the challenge in Angola today is the community of God's people, a third of the population, 10 or plus million followers of Jesus, who are beginning to recognize that they've ducked over the issues of social responsibility to their neighbor. And I think if you look in our own context in Canada, one of the strongest lessons surely we have to learn is how we've handed social services to our government to take care of and haven't done it as followers of Jesus. And when we ducked on those fundamentals, we've lost the credibility to say that Jesus loves you so that he went to a cross and died and his blood was spilled and that cost him broken relationship with his father. And wow. And when you care for your neighbor, and when you pour oil on troubled waters, and when the leprosy feet become the feet of Jesus, and when the broken and the crippled are cared for in ways that speaks, you don't have to speak too loudly about the person who sent you. Because the question in an African's mind is, what? And why are you still here? Surely the Marxists told you that they were going to destroy the church. And they sure tried for 30 plus years. It's taken us 45 years to get to the beginning of starting a postgraduate training in general surgery through the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons. Lord willing, January 1st, we begin a training program. One of the reasons I came here today is I need a chief of department. <laughs> you can come and become our chief of the department of medicine and cardiology and it's it's one of these wonderful things that god is doing in this crazy world of ours is that places where the gospel has been denigrated the love of jesus has been castigated no one took it seriously 25 years of trying to extinguish the light the church doubled in size. And you meet men and women who thought it was nothing to give up their lives and become martyrs for the sake of the kingdom of God, who are standing in glory today, looking down on us and are wondering about our own faithfulness. And it's those kinds of things that keeps me at 74 starting to wonder what a privilege it is to work with men and women who know that the king's business is the business. And that in the long and the short of it, it's going to take every single one of us to unpack that reality in the context we're all part of. And so we pray that we'll be faithful in Angola and we'll hold Canadian feet to the fire. And dear brother, you better come and visit us. <laughs> and we're going to look forward to what God's going to do. But thank you, Stan, for this privilege to, to share with you and, and just uh, Oh, we love to, to see you all come and visit us. There's a theological seminary in Lubango with a master's degree program where my sister is the head of the professional group developing master's programs. Two or three PhDs in the, in the pipeline all going down to Stellenbosch and places in South Africa. 
There isn't a PhD program in Angola yet. So some of you bright sparks, come and visit us and bring, hold the banner high. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. It's great to hear uh, your story. And if those of you were wondering, like, what is this about Hinnan over here? He is a cardiologist, in case you don't know. So, and he speaks Portuguese, and that's what they speak in Angola. So, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> All right, let's stand and sing. I sing the mighty power of God.
let's read together, all of us, uh, Psalm 29. It's on the slides, it's in your bulletin, and we will just read the entire thing together and then say the Lord's Prayer and uh, sing a couple of more songs. Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. And let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
this come up? A few weeks ago, uh, my graduating high school class celebrated its 50th uh, graduating celebration. I just dated myself uh, there a, a bit. Uh, and uh, Washington State was a bit far. I didn't make it, uh, re regrettably. Uh, but I, I, I was able to look on the webpage, and what grabbed me, I was going to say struck me, but it, it grabbed me, was the list of my classmates who have deceased since graduation. I had a graduating class of 810, uh, and 75 names were on uh, the list. Uh, you know, some of them you know, were people I went back to grade school with, you know, people I did sports with, girls I dated, gone. Uh, and uh, it, you know, it strikes you that you're 17, 18, you think you got, you know, life in your in your grip and you're full of promise and all of the things that you hope to do in life are, are right there in front of you that you celebrate at what we call commencement for a reason right uh, but then life happens uh, and i i got thinking as well as the friends that i made in college when jesus got a hold of me uh, and christian friends again celebrating together the you know the things we were going to do for the kingdom uh, and then uh, life happens. Uh, babies die. Uh, friends get divorced. Uh, people get horrible sickness and in accidents. And so life happens and, and it sobers you up uh, to the fact that, that chaos uh, in life is just beneath the surface. Uh, it's there uh, in the blink uh, of an eye. Now we, we who live in North America uh, have a, a fortune that we uh, don't uh, often celebrate enough uh, of how uh, easy we really do have it compared to the majority uh, world, which knows chaos far better uh, than we do. Uh, and so uh, for them, life is, you know, is, it's hanging in the cloud. Is it going to rain or not? Uh, do I eat? Uh, life is hanging in the bullets uh, that might fly through the air. Uh, realities that we, uh, you know, don't face uh, in our comfort, but are a daily reality of many people uh, uh, who uh, share this planet with us. Uh, this is surely closer to the reality for ancient Israel that was far more vulnerable, far more dependent, uh, and their their sense, they weren't far more dependent any more than we are dependent. They were more aware of their dependence, I guess, than uh, we are uh, on the things around us. Uh, that chaos is a part of their world, their everyday experience. And it's in this context of life that Psalm 29 uh, speaks uh, into. The psalm breaks into three parts, as praise psalms often do. There's a call to worship, first two verses. Uh, and then starting in verse 3 uh, through 9 is the cause for worship. Uh, what does the psalmist base uh, his call uh, upon? And we learn the truths about God that undergird our praise. And then the third part of the psalm often is a renewed call to praise. Uh, but in this case, uh, there's an unpacking of the practical implications, the, the application uh, of the re of the realities about God that uh, uh, have just been sung uh, in the, uh, the psalm. So first, uh, the call to praise, first two verses, uh, bowing before the majestic God, ascribe to the Lord heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name, worship uh, the Lord uh, in uh, holy splendor, probably his holy splendor, not the jackets that, that we uh, where and so the old Greek and NIV, uh, I think, have it uh, right there that God uh, is there uh, in this enthronement scene. It's in the heavenly court, 
uh, where he is enthroned in all of his magnificent uh, glory, uh, light uh, that we can't look at. Uh, that even the angels who were there uh, described, we learn in other texts, are covering their faces, uh, but with those wings because of the uh, splendor uh, of a glorious God. So these heavenly beings uh, are bowing down, falling on their faces, as it were, uh, to uh, worship God, and how much more than, how much greater is the call upon us uh, mortal humans uh, to ourselves recognize our place uh, before the Creator uh, and to uh, worship His majesty uh, along with these uh, angelic hosts. In fact, the ascribe, 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 worship, that, that pairing of commands appears in Psalm 96, calling upon uh, not the angels there, but upon all of us, all nations, uh, with the same exact expressions uh, to worship God. So angelic beings call, uh, bow down, and praise uh, the majesty of the holy God. Ascribe, 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 and then the shift to the second part of the psalm, the cause for praise, and there are seven voices uh, of God uh, that are there. Uh, voice of the Lord's over the waters, uh, God of glory thunders, that's his voice, the Lord over mighty waters, an image throughout uh, the Old Testament, Psalm 93, is a great parallel uh, of waters that are unruly and, in fact, would rise up and challenge uh, with their voice. They would challenge the voice of God. Uh, Psalm 93 merits your meditation uh, some time. But the voice of the Lord is over those waters. Uh, it's powerful. It's, uh, his voice is full of majesty. He breaks the cedars. He breaks the cedars of Lebanon uh, he makes Lebanon uh, uh, skip around like a young calf uh, and uh, Syrian like a wild uh, young ox. Uh, his voice flashes forth flames of fire, shakes the wilderness, uh, shakes the wilderness of uh, Kadesh, Kadesh, however you want to pronounce it. His voice causes the oaks to whirl, or in some translations, it's a tough text, flip the coin. Uh, makes the deers uh, uh, go into premature labor because they are so terrified uh, at uh, the sound of his uh, thunder. And he strips the forest bare, and then everything in his temple uh, says uh, glory. You know, the temple is, again, the throne uh, of God. Now, to, to appreciate this uh, section of the psalm, it, it's helpful to, to share a bit what every Israelite probably understood because it was in the air that they breathed, just like Grimm's fairy tales uh, are in uh, our air, whether we've ever read Brothers Grimm or not. Uh, we know about Hansel, uh, uh, Hans and Gretel and, and uh, you know, these other rather morbid uh, stories, uh, but, but they are things that we grew up with. And so in, in the air of the land of Israel, uh, ancient Canaan, were, were the stories about the god uh, Baal, who was uh, at times the chief god of the Canaanites. And in, in the story of Baal, uh, he uh, uh, is uh, extolled as uh, the god who becomes the king of the gods. Well, how does he come by that honor? Well, he goes into battle head to head uh, with uh, the god of the unruly, chaotic uh, waters, the sea. And he goes into battle and, and defeats uh, the sea and becomes, by that uh, victory, the king of the gods, just like Marduk in the Mesopotamian uh, tradition. Uh, it's the same story, just swap out uh, the names. And so Baal uh, shows he's the king, and so every good king gets a palace built for him. Uh, the palace is built out of cedars, you know, the, in that you know, that day, the great, if you know the California redwoods, these trees that you can cut a hole in it and drive, you know, a van through the middle of it. These majestic uh, trees uh, are the, uh, the sought-after timbers of every monarch for their monumental architecture. So his palace is built out of, of cedars, uh, and it's, uh, windows put there, out of which he thunders forth uh, with his voice, 
uh, and he throws uh, you know, lightning to earth. And so in the iconography of the ancient world, it shows Baal and his characteristic posture with a, a mace and holding a lightning bolt uh, in one uh, hand that's striking on the earth. And, and one image has him walking upon the mountains and the waves of, uh, of the sea. Well, Baal uh, has, uh, in uh, the tradition, has seven thunders. And I don't know if you've ever bothered to count. If you're a sort of uh, anal retentive person like me, whose dad was an accountant, uh, you, you, you know, you get into these things. Well, seven voices uh, of the Lord in this uh, psalm. I think corresponding to the seven uh, reputed voices of, uh, of Baal uh, himself. So it's not Baal who's the victor over the waters of chaos, it's the Lord. It's not Baal who has seven thunders or voices. It's the same word in Ugaritic as is used in the Hebrew text here. Uh, it's the Lord who uh, utters his voice seven times. Baal's house may be made of the cedars of Lebanon, but the Lord breaks those cedars. And then in the parallel verse, uh, the verb form changes to this form that stresses that he, he busts them into pieces. It's as though the Lord takes these magnificent cedars and breaks them into toothpicks. Uh, so much for the building material of Baal's temple. Baal's weapon was lightning. No, it wasn't. Uh, the Lord's weapon is lightning. Baal makes the ground shake, the earthquake. No, it's the Lord. Baal receives a temple after defeating chaos. No, it is the Lord who is the king in heaven, whose glory uh, is evident in his uh, temple. It is not Baal who is the king of the gods. Uh, it's the Lord uh, who is the king uh, of the gods. So striking is this imagery that some scholars speculate that this is borrowed and taken from a, you know, from a Canaanite hymn of some kind. I, some kind. I, I'm not convinced of that, but it, it underscores how close the imagery is to someone who is familiar with sort of the world pictures uh, of the people uh, in the day that the psalm uh, was written. Well, you probably all know the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Uh, and he's, you know, it's a contest between are you going to worship Baal or are you going to worship Yahweh, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob? And uh, the altars are built, and which God is going to uh, consume uh, the altar? And uh, the prophets of Baal go through their gyrations, nada, nothing. Uh, Elijah prays and then, uh, you know, waits, and then eventually on the horizon there's this speck of a cloud, and so you get this image of a cloud forming as it does in the wa waters over the Mediterranean, and it moves towards the shore, hits the mountain, close to the mountain range, and, and you get thunder uh, and lightning, and of course lightning comes down, uh, consumes, uh, uh, you know, the altar, uh, and the rain that had been held off for years uh, comes. And so Elijah said, who are you going to serve? There's a choice before the people. Uh, is it going to be Baal or, or is it going to be uh, Yahweh? And the psalm, of course, tells us you know, who really is God uh, and who really is the king. Uh, and the choice uh, is the same before us. It's just that the other gods, the names have changed whether it's Baal or Marduk, uh, or is it science? Are the ultimate uh, realities, the ultimate answers to life's questions to be found in the distances of space or in the smallest things uh, inside uh, the atom? How about technology? What, what's, what's really going to resolve the climate problem? Uh, or do we, uh, in our best efforts, unleash other unintended consequences? Uh, which often uh, is the case that we really don't know what we're doing <laughs> and trying to manage uh, creation well. It's not science, it's, it's not uh, technology where the final answers are. Medicine, all respects to uh, medical people who are present uh, for all the wonders that it does, uh, is really not the final answer. Uh, uh, the one who heals ultimately, it's not medicine and our hope uh, in life uh, is not to be found there. Uh, how about government? This is, uh, you know, one that's close to my heart uh, these these days. Uh, you, you know uh, Daniel 7, probably, 
uh, the, the vision of Daniel where the, the, the waters are churned up by the, by the winds from all directions of the planet uh, and out of this mess of, of stormy waves, these monsters come out. Uh, not human beings to rule, but composite monsters that don't fit any category of creation. Uh, and so the, the great governments of the world are all characterized as these horrible, uh, terrifying looking chaos monsters. That's the biblical theology of human government. Uh, it, it, it's necessary, but evil. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we often forget that in, in our hopes, and in particular in, in my home country, as you know, the United States, uh, many of my brothers and sisters uh, you know, are frankly worshiping the idol of government. And uh, that's not where the ultimate uh, hope uh, is uh, to be found. Uh, as uh, Gary Haugen, uh, president of uh, the uh, International Justice Mission once said, the fall is not well managed. Uh, by the governments of this planet. And that's, that's really an understatement. And, and it's not just a chaos in the Western governments, it's more terrifying and imminent uh, is, uh, is the chaos in uh, you know, the Middle East right now in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, there's no solution that I can think of, that I've heard that, nor that I've heard anyone be able to think of. Uh, no human uh, solution. Uh, to that, uh, we've come to our wits and uh, for answers. Well, uh, the problems of chaos are not just uh, at this sort of global scale, they're also at, at an intimate uh, individual scale as well. Uh, when, when we get uh, down to uh, the uh, next section of the psalm, uh, the Lord gloriously reigns uh, in majesty over all creation, and in particular, uh, the waters, which are symbolic of chaos. Uh, but we'll, we'll learn that uh, these waters are also individual, because the mighty waters in Psalm 32.6 uh, are, uh, are the, the, the maladies that can afflict the individual life. Read Psalm 32. It's, it's a... Uh, it's a Thanksgiving psalm uh, for forgiveness, uh, and it's an encouragement to pray uh, to the Lord uh, at a time while he's found, because when the waters are rising, the mighty waters, the same word that's used in Psalm 29, uh, uh, he may not be found uh, by us in that situation. So the waters could be global, the waters can be individual, our health, uh, the problems in our family lives, those in the lives of people that we love, uh, around us or the habits of our heart uh, that haunt us uh, continually uh, in life. The Lord reigns over all those gloriously. So after the seven voices, we finally turn to uh, imagery uh, of God being enthroned uh, is the catchword of the last section. And so what was implicit in the first two verses, this courtroom scene of God's heavenly council, uh, where he's in, you know, his glory is there in his temple, that's his court. Uh, and here uh, we are explicitly told that, this, that the Lord uh, is enthroned. He sits enthroned over the flood. Uh, he sits enthroned as king forever. It's explicit uh, here. Uh, I, uh, I thought that uh, Paul uh, would appreciate this, so I, I brought a, a page out of, where's Paul Evans? There he is. Uh, his, his buddy, uh, the Neo-Syrian king Sennacherib, but a little uh, snippet from Sennacherib's annals. It describes Sennacherib's boasting over the destruction of Babylon. And I want you to, uh, to catch the, the key word in here that Sennacherib uh, uses. I dug canals through the city and flooded its place with water, destroying the structure of its foundation. I made its devastation greater than that of the flood. Uh, it's the tradition that was known throughout the ancient Near East of, of the cataclysmic divine destruction of, of humanity uh, with the ultimate divine weapon. It's not the lightning bolt, it's the flood that ultimately destroys anything and everything uh, in its path. And so Sennacherib here uses that imagery uh, of 
uh, of the ultimate power and the ultimate destruction that can be unleashed. And here we're told by the psalmist that the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. Uh, he is king and holds in his hands uh, the power uh, that is ultimate in, uh, in this creation. He sits enthroned as king forever. And then uh, the psalmist uh, turns finally uh, to unpacking the application. Uh, I'm reading out of the N N N NRSV. It says, may the Lord give strength to his people. I think, uh, where's Mark here? Yeah, the NIV gets it right here. Uh, you, the, you know, the word, yeah, yeah, it's, it's the, yeah, well, I'll read the NIV. Um, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people uh, with peace. Uh, the, uh, the, the word order uh, is, uh, is here marking uh, not a prayer, but it's marking something that's characteristic or perhaps future, uh, but I think characteristic uh, in the context of the psalm catches it uh, well. It's, it's, uh, it's just what God does. Uh, it comes out of who he is. Uh, he is a God who gives peace. Now, on, upon that basis, we can pray for peace, uh, and I do. Uh, but this is stressing for us that the Lord gives strength uh, and the Lord blesses uh, us uh, with uh, his peace. As king of creation, the Lord brings peace to uh, his people. And I think I shared at the faculty retreat uh, you know, we shared something that over the summer, uh, I think it was, that Wendy had asked us to, you know, to share about ways in which God was really, his reality was evident in our lives. And, and I had to say that I was just at times despaired uh, over the, the chaos on, on this planet in my own home country. Uh, and I would go to the Lord in prayer, maybe meditate on a psalm, and I meditated on Psalm uh, 29, I have a lot. Uh, and it's, it has spoken to my condition because there were many times when just for no rational reason, well, I guess a rational reason, the cause for praise here, but uh, I mean, the, the God's spirit uh, impressed me with uh, a sense of, of peace that uh, things are out of my hands and they're out of human hands, but God is king and, and in, uh, in control of, uh, of it all. And so we can turn uh, to, uh, to God, uh, the Father who's creator, uh, the Son who's the victor, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, who, uh, whose power is imminent uh, in us and can uh, bring us peace. We're coming up on Advent sooner than we realize, I think. You know, it seems like you, know, you turn in November and then conferences are on us at least those of us in biblical and theological studies, and then conferences hit, and the next thing you know, it's Christmas. So Advent comes, and of course, we'll look at, Saul, uh, at Isaiah 9, anticipating the, uh, the, the royal servant of the Lord, who is what? Prince of... Jim? <laughs> peace. Thank you. Uh, the, prince, uh, the Prince of Peace. Uh, at, the, uh, at the birth of Jesus, the angels call out, glory to God in the highest, verses 1 and 2. Peace to his people on earth, verses 9, uh, and, or 10 uh, and uh, 11 here. And then it's Jesus who uh, goes out and he, uh, he sits uh, in Mark 4, 1. He sits uh, on the boat. Uh, well, he sits on the boat, but he sits... On the sea, the Greek says, stresses both. And I, I don't think that's accidental because we learn later, you all know that Jesus is the one who calms the storm uh, of the sea. And, and he, you know, he's doing what Yahweh in the Old Testament did, that whatever is the portfolio of Yahweh in the Old Testament becomes the portfolio of Jesus uh, in the Gospels. And so uh, Jesus is the one who shows uh, his royal kingship as creator uh, when he calms the storm. And there's no doubt uh, that he uh, means his business when he, his last words include, peace uh, I give to you. Uh, you know, he could, could be quoting Psalm 29, uh, 11 there, uh, but not a peace that the world gives 
uh, does he give? And so Paul looks back and says, Jesus uh, is uh, our peace uh, with God. Having been justified by faith, we have uh, peace uh, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus personally knew the knocks of life. Uh, he faced chaos down. Uh, he uh, absorbed chaos uh, in his suffering uh, and swallowed it up uh, in his own uh, victory. So he knew what we face, and he anticipated that in his teaching uh, and in the good news that he proclaims to us to proclaim to our culture. And our theme is church and culture uh, this year. Uh, and that is the message of good news that we have, uh, especially, you know, these days uh, of a word of, of peace uh, and the only hope uh, that we have. Uh, so in my closing, may the peace of Christ be with you all. Will you please stand and we will close by singing the more familiar version of it as well. John, I want to thank you for stepping in uh, with short notice to speak instead of Imad, who couldn't be here today. And thinking of Lebanon in our passage and Lebanon where he is as well. So I really am grateful to you for doing that and for turning our attention toward this and for um, inviting us to conclude with this song. So let's sing it as well.
thank you, Stephen, for being with us. Appreciate that. Thank you, John, so much for your, your great words today. Thank you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity we have to have come into your presence, to have taken this time to put our eyes upon you, your son, Jesus, to be ministered to by your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, now as we go our separate ways, that you would continue to bless us in all of our activities. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good day.